Hello and welcome to the Practical Animal Channel. Have you ever wondered just what it takes to work with the Scottish Wildcat? The channel is for you if you want to know what it takes to work with animals. That could be with domestic species, such as companion animals, dogs and cats, or it could be with agricultural livestock. Perhaps you want to work with wild animals. If you want to work with wildlife, that could be either in the wild as a field biologist, or it could be in captivity as a zookeeper, for example, in a collection. Whatever species you want to work with, we aim to cover it all. The interviews that I hold every week have the flavour of a conversation between somebody who is curious about an animal and an expert working with that animal. The kind of conversation that might take place during the interval of a conference. Each week I interview an animal industry professional asking them what are the skills, experiences and personal qualities that are needed to be successful working with that animal. My next guest is Sally Holt. She is the Wildcat Lead at the Wildwood Trust in the south of England. And she's joining me here today to tell us all about what it takes to work with the Scottish Wildcat. You're not going to want to miss this one. Enjoy. Sally Holt, Wildcat Lead at the Wildwood Trust. Welcome to the Practical Animal Channel. Hello, thank you for having me. Sally, you work with Scottish Wildcats. Please, can you describe your career from the start to date? Yeah, of course. So probably a bit different to other people that are working with animals or I have got their way there. But uh, my career actually started doing an English degree at university and ending up working as a journalist in London initially. Um, so quite different from where I've ended up, but realising quite quickly um, once I started doing that job in London that I was quite probably the, the most unhappiest I've ever been in my life and not, not wanting to do it at all and feeling a little bit stuck and, and didn't really know a way out and, and realising very quickly that I wanted to, to work outdoors. And it was... Looking on it now, I don't know how I ended up there really. I've always liked animals and, and loved nature and wildlife and uh, realized the error of my ways quite quickly. And uh, at that time had my own property and, and wasn't in a position to be able to go back to university because I needed a job to, to fund, um, fund, fund the house. Um, so started looking around to see what I could do to get a way in. And uh, luckily, this is going back about 11 years ago now, a enrichment course was was going um, at an, an, an animal establishment in Kent and you didn't need any prior animal experience to actually attend it so I applied for that and, and got on that and it, that was a five-day course where we just learned about animal enrichment and um, whether you had pet pets that you could apply that to or you worked in a zoological organization that you could apply that to um, and just made a, a bit of a nuisance I think of myself of of staying on afterwards and chatting to the organisation um, and the people involved that were hosting the workshop and attending the social events that they put on as well. And by the end of the week, um, I asked whether there'd be any volunteering positions at either the establishments that they, they worked for, which was Howlett's and Port Lim at the time. And couldn't afford to be fussy with what that volunteering position would be. I was just desperate to get into it and then get a foot in the door and then then progress to what I actually wanted to work with eventually. And uh, oh, just it was just, I think a lot of it was luck as well. And luckily a position was available to work on hoofstock animals at Howlett's and um, jumped at the opportunity. So I was working five days a week in, in London doing quite long hours as anyone that has worked in the city will know what that's like and the commuting. And then what, filling my weekends volunteering at, at the animal park and absolutely loved it. And just felt, it just felt so right. I was just so happy and, and just knew that this was what I should have been doing right from the start and was then determined to make sure I, I fulfilled that ambition. And uh, it happened quite quickly when I look back. So I actually only volunteered for four months and then 
a job came up at Wildwood where I work now and it was a maternity cover job and I, d I went for it not thinking I'd get it based on very limited volunteering experience and uh, I, I don't I still don't know how I, I got that to this day but but I did and luckily while I was there within a few months of that post it actually turned into a full-time position of which they offered me so um absolutely took it with with both hands and jumped at the opportunity and again it, it didn't really matter at the time what I was working with because it was new to me and uh, so initially started working with with badges successfully bred pine martins red squirrels um hazel dormice and my my career was was developing quite quickly and um always knew though um, that Wildcats was where I wanted to end up. At the time, there wasn't an opportunity to move over um, and work there and uh, was keeping a, an, an eye open to make sure that there, if there was an opportunity that I'd, I'd be on it pretty quickly. And, and luckily again, within two years of working at Wildwood, an opportunity came up to, to move over and work with the species. Um, and so I did. And then quite quickly after working with them, one of our Wildcats uh, had a kitten, which unfortunately she rejected. and it was my first sort of hand rearing experience of an animal, which, you know, it, those decisions are never taken lightly. There's lots to always consider when you're hand rearing an animal, um, but hand reared um, Isla is what we called her. And that really just set it going for me, just had such, a, such an interest in this species anyway. And then to be able to get up close and personal with, with, with a wildcat, which just, you know, as you might know, it's, they're pretty unheard of to be quite tame or, or to be friendly with, with humans at all. And uh, just that experience was in, incredible and um, gave me a lot of opportunities. And because she remained quite tame and does remain tame, um, it, it gave me opportunities to present on that finding and, um, and write some articles about it as well. So it just gave myself opportunities to develop that, that wildcat career a bit further. Um, and then as the years have gone by, I just looked at enclosure designs, things like that, and presented on those. And then a couple of years ago, uh, we had we hosted a workshop at Wildwood actually on red squirrels and had Carl Jones attend the workshop and they asked me if I could do a wildcat presentation which I said yep yeah, that's fine happy to do it and just before I went up someone told me that Carl Jones was going to be presenting on wildcats after me <laughs> so my my nerve suddenly hit an all-time high <laughs> and uh, anyway did the presentation and Carl did his and I sat with him at lunch that day and he's just such a humble man and just really inspirational on that on that front actually and was so willing to learn from the knowledge I knew and we just had this we just didn't stop talking about wildcats all lunchtime and um, a few months later um, we actually formed a partnership with Durrell and Vincent Wildlife Trust to on a new project to basically breed the wildcat here at Wildwood to restore a population outside of Scotland um, with Durrell and Vincent in, in a collaborative project. And so now my job is project leading on the ex situ facilities for this wildcat project here at Wildwood. So yeah, that's where we are today. Absolutely fantastic. I love that story. <laughs> you know Carl was so involved. I know yeah, Carl, definitely. he's been interviewed on this channel. Carl's great. So, Sally, what has been your proudest moment working with Wildcats? So, proudest moment is joint with presenting in front of Carl Jones. Definitely, that was that was a very proud moment for me. And I think though the the the, uh, the top experience is so our breeding female at Wildwood, um, breeding female cats that we had at Wildwood was just when I first started she never wanted to, she never was out on show which is is quite normal for the breed they're quite an elusive animal um but she was she was never out on show and she was very um she was she was very fussy with her food and actually only ate one food item even though we all, always offered her a variation of food she only ate one food item so her diet wasn't particularly good um and she I suppose the main thing is she was having kittens but then she wasn't recruiting them to adults. So she kept destroying those kittens. Um, so overall, uh, from a keeper observation, this is telling me that this cat's clearly not very happy or comfortable in her in environment and just set it upon myself to, to learn this individual cat. And it, it took a lot of work, just a lot of observational work, working out 
her, her behavior and why she's not particularly happy and what we can do to alter it. And so um, we were looking at enclosure design, the complexity within the enclosure and realizing that there were certain things probably lacking in the enclosure, which could help her feel more comfortable being on show. And so we changed some elements. So one of them was giving her more resting sites up high. So while cats aren't our boar animals at all, um, they like to be on the ground. And yet in captivity, a lot of things are very different for, for different animals. So we put up more boxes up high and suddenly she she's out, she's on show more and she's sleeping on show. She's more comfortable. Even though she still has the option to go off show, she was choosing to be on show. So that was, that was me learning as well. Um, and then it was a very painless task on getting her to have a different um, and a varied diet, very painful task of actually, so rabbits are a wild cat's main source of prey and I'd give her rabbit, she wouldn't even touch it. And it was almost like feeding a, a kitten again, weaning onto solid food. So I was having to cut um, little bits of rabbit meat off the bone and present them to her initially. Um, of which she started to consume, which was brilliant, and then eventually present that food on the bone, and then eventually she was she was actually eating a whole rabbit with the fur on and everything. So we managed to get past those barriers, um, and she just seemed, without sounding probably a bit inappropriate, but she just seemed to become a happier cat because of that, and probably healthier as well because her diet was was more varied. And then the next challenge was getting her to recruit these kittens to to adults, and again it took lots of manipulation of different factors but essentially she did manage to do it she went on to have another three sets of kittens three lists of kittens and managed to to rear them all by herself and that was that was probably my proudest moment and that really involved looking at our enclosure designs at Wildwood looking at keeper routine looking at um, the presence of the male in the enclosure lots of different factors um, and she re that cat really, I owe a lot of my knowledge to, um, and, and the reason behind a lot of the design of the, the new captive breeding facilities that are happening today. What's your biggest guilty pleasure at work? I think there's two, actually. Um, one's probably more professional than the other. <laughs> but I would say I've always had an interest in, in outside and, and the lover of the countryside. And so particularly during the spring and summer months, I'll often between work, because um, Wildwood's set in a, a lovely ancient woodland, I'll often take myself off when I can and go searching for particularly wildflowers and, and butterflies and, and capture as many as I can so I can say to people what I've seen before they've seen it. Um, and then probably not so professional is certainly at, at Christmas time, if we've got a box of celebrations in, in our keeper staff from I'll pop in and, and grab the best ones for other people can. <laughs> What's your best wildcat fact, please? Best wildcat fact is they're, they're, they are, they're legendary for being known for being untamable um, and having this really ferocious, feisty nature. And even, even back in, in years and years ago, Highland tribes would wear the wildcat on their crest to, to represent the tribe of, of having this, this really ferocious nature. And if they were threatened, they had the wildcat on the crest. And but so I, I like that fact of being being able to say to people they're they're known for being untamable. It's been going on for, for hundreds and hundreds of years, having this reputation, um, and then being able to turn around and say that actually um, I, I have a tame a tame wild cat at work that I hand reared. So that's it's quite nice to be able to say that. Maybe <laughs> controversial. <laughs> She's fairly tame with me, but she has her moments, and there are. There are certain keepers that she she does not like and she certainly shows those those behaviors um so so tame yes but uh you know i, I wouldn't i wouldn't trust her with, with many people um and even with myself you know she is a wild animal and you can't you can't get complacent with that behavior at all working with wild cats that's got to be a pretty good and sought after job sally what are the skills experiences and personal qualities that have been key to your success to work with wildcats okay so I, th I think it's hard to to narrow down just for wildcats i think i think if any ever animal you ever want to work with enthusiasm for that animal is going to go a long long way for you to, to kick start that career and, and to ensure that's the animal that you want to work with and um i i, I love small feelings i always have done i, I remember being 
I remember going to the zoo with my, my dad and my brother and we were one of the most irritating families that would stay on until it was about to close because we'd go and see if the cats are out because we knew that how elusive they were and they'd only come out around dusk time or in, in the early hours in the morning and um, probably irritated um, the zookeepers because we'd be asked to, to leave the park because we wanted to see these small cats. Um, so the enthusiasm for small felids for me has been there from a, a really, really early age. Um, and I think that goes a hell of a long way. And it, it just shows if you really want to work for something, you'll, you'll do what you, what you can to get there. And it, it didn't come without hard work. I said initially how I started my career, it, it didn't come without hard work. And, and uh, so hard work, determination, self-discipline. I think if you really want to learn about something, you, you can't expect it to come to you. You've, you've got to find the facts out yourself. And I spent a lot of my own time attending conferences and, and meetings and again, contacting other individuals who have, have, were working with small feelers to, to learn what I could about the animals themselves. And not always about wild cats, not, not all collections hold wild cats, but just trying to learn about small feelers in general and what I could take from that knowledge and install at, at Wildwood. Um, and I think it, it, a lot of it is independent work and using your initiative I think more so it's more about teamwork and just seeing how much you can learn from other people. And that's not just in my own organization, but on, on outside organizations as well. So having have being very collaborative in your approach to working um, and not and absolutely not being afraid to share your ideas as well. So, you know, we haven't always got it right at Wildwood and, and I'm always, always learning, always. And so are, so are the people around you and it's just so important that you share your knowledge and you, you share the good things you share the bad things so you don't learn the same you don't do the same things um so always sharing um, your information and i think another way of being successful with the animal you want to work with is is not being afraid to to challenge people and as difficult as that being it's not it's not the most comfortable thing for people to do and it's not something that used to come naturally for me and it still isn't really but if the end of the day your animals don't have a voice and you know your animal better than anyone else and if you don't necessarily agree with a decision that's being made it, it's okay to say that you don't agree with it and as long as you you know you have a justified reason for it um so don't be afraid to challenge ideas and and they also accept that your ideas will be challenged as well because you might not always be right and that's okay as well and and just having that very open mind um, that you can always learn from from anyone no matter their experience and um, yeah I think I don't know there's there's so many skills to become to, to, to do what you want to do and work with the animal you want to work with um, but yeah just just really hard work enthusiasm determination it goes a hell of a long way and I'd just making a habit and, and becoming a nuisance I think and and taking opportunities that come up so um, Biarga, for example, contact uh, zoos every year to see whether zoo professionals want to present on the animals that they're working with and the finders that they found that, that, that past year, whether that's success in breeding, um, enclosure design, anything, they want you to present on it. And I took those opportunities when I could and, and presenting at, at Biarga, some, some different working groups, um, writing articles for, for other magazines, um, when we were successful with kittens, taking the opportunity to talk to the media about it and, and just talk about the species even more and, and basically become an ambassador for the species. Um, so yeah, just just make the most of opportunities that come up and, and yeah, just, just I, I love meeting people as well. So when I go to these events and I can network with people, I like to be able to, to leave the place and leave the room that I've been in and, and know a good deal of people and I've left it, so. Yeah, I think that's a whole host of, I could go on and on for skills, but I'll, I'll keep it brief. That's great. Sally, which people, meetings or books have most influenced your thinking? Um, I would probably say my grandfather, actually, John. So he... I think he was the one that really got me into loving of, of the countryside and he took me all around all around England, um, all different places in the countryside. So and just really fueled my love for, for nature and wildlife and would teach me all the different things we were looking at. Um, so I think he really indirectly um, had a massive impact on where I am today. Um, and just he just his his whole aspect of, of his life, he worked his way up um, in a company and got to the very top, but he's such a humble man. And, uh, you know, he told me a story once that 
um, you know, don't don't forget where you've come from and just always just be open minded and, and learn. You can learn from anyone. And he would go around a room full of people and even though he'd never met everyone, but would know everyone by the end of it and, and would learn from them. Um, and I, I don't know, I just, I find him very inspiring and he's, he's, he always taught me as well that sometimes you're not always going to be right in life and you're not always going to get what you want the first time round. It doesn't mean you should give up and just try again, because if you really want it, you'll get there. Um, so definitely him. And I'm just lucky um, at work throughout my career that I've been surrounded by some very talented individuals and people that have encouraged me and motivated me and I'd like to think that I've taken a lot of their skill sets and applied them to myself and helped other people as well along the way. That's great. Sally, does hybridisation of Scottish wildcats with feral domestic cats, does that continue to be a problem for the Scottish wildcat? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the, the main threat for wildcats today is hybridisation with domestic cats. So latest research has actually said that the the population that does remain in the wild so there's only a very small population left in the uk which is in the highlands of scotland and that population that does exist has now been has now been deemed what they call functionally extinct so it basically means that the population that is currently um, residing in scotland is too hybridized and too small and too fragmented now to survive without the help of reintroduction projects so it's, it, hybridization, yes, is very much a, a threat to the existence of the wildcat today. That's interesting. Thank you. It's, it's been a problem for, for years then, hasn't it? Uh, Sally, how would you describe wildcat conservation in the wild and in captivity today? Okay, so in the wild, um, it's, it's under threat massively. And so the only way now that we can conserve what's in the world is by efforts in captivity. And now more than I think than ever, I think, John, the efforts for conservation in captivity has is gone beyond, really. Um, there's a project in Scotland called Saving Wildcats. Uh, Wild are actually part of that. We've bred wildcat kittens for that project. So they are looking to breed wildcats to bolster the current wild population in Scotland. And then we have the new project that Wildwood have formed with Vincent and Durrell, where we are going to be breeding wildcats offshore at Wildwood to restore a population of wildcats outside of Scotland. Um, so more than ever, um, conservation captivity is, is going on bigger than it ever has done. That's good to hear. Um, how do you see wildcat conservation changing over the next 10 years, Sally? I think we're going to be extremely busy, busier than we ever have done um, wildcat conservation, um, because we have to be. If we, if we, don't, if we don't get busy and, and get it sorted, the animal will go extinct without a doubt. Um, so I would like to see, I would hope within the next 10 years, we will be having cats being released into Scotland and hopefully bolstering that population and cats surviving. And for our project, I'd like to think within the next 10 years, we'll have all of our offshore enclosures where we're going to breed these cats will be filled with cats that are, are happily producing young and raising their young. I'd like to think we're seeing those kittens that are going to go for release, um, or those cats that go for release will be showing the signs that we would like to see for them to know they're going to survive and they're going to be fit enough to survive. And I mean, ideally, I'd certainly like to think within the next 20 years, um, the population that, that, that we're going to hopefully restore outside of Scotland will be surviving on its own with little help from humans. Um, so yeah, that, that's where I'd like to see where we are. Um, it's going to be busy, it's going to be, it's going to be quite full on, but it's very exciting at the same time. Yeah. Wildcats, I'm guessing, are a keystone species in the wild. They certainly are a flagship species. It must be pretty great working with them. Um, Sally, how can someone get a career in wildcat conservation? Okay, so definitely it's easier said than done, and I know that because that's how I got my way in, but volunteer if you can, um, it's particularly at establishments that have wildcats in it, I mean that, that would be ideal, um, but I know that's not always easy, so any volunteering that, that you can get, um, particularly with small feelings, that, that's going to really help you get into wildcat conservation. Um, if you can't get into that, then ideally native species uh, volunteering or having that on your CV for native species is going to go a long way for you. 
Um, and if you can't get that, just, just volunteering with, with animals um, is, is going to do really, really well for you. And it hasn't necessarily got to be in, in an animal park, just, just anything you can get volunteering wise is going to be really helpful. Um, just showing an, an interest in not even necessarily wildcats, but just the, the outside world and what's going on around you, having knowledge of, of the countryside that, and, and what we have around us, that's going to go a long way. Just native native wildflowers, native wildlife, um, just, just general knowledge is going to go a long way for you. If you, if you have a way of being able to express that, if you, if you get to a volunteer interview and you can, you can show that knowledge, that's going to go a long way and making the use of, you know, even social media channels. If you have social media, that's a good platform for you to be able to, to show your skill set or your interest. Um, so sharing posts or, or getting in touch with people on LinkedIn, um, if yeah, ideally volunteering is going to go a, a hell of a long way for you and um you know a lot of we recruit a lot of our volunteers eventually because we know how they've been working we can see how enthusiastic they are and they've dedicated their their time sometimes on top of a full-time job to come in and work in all sorts of weather um and it does it does go a long way so don't don't give up as well you know it's um volunteer positions are, are very highly sought after but don't give up and they, they do come up and uh yeah just 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 make a nuisance of yourself definitely it makes me think sally are there many collections in the uk with wild cats or only a handful um actually there's i think last time i read which wasn't that long ago there's 38 collections that have wild cats now in the uk not all of them um on, on show to the public um, but more more so than there ever ever has been, um, have wildcats in their collections. So it's probably a good time, a good opportunity for people actually to be able to volunteer and get some wildcat experience because more collections have them than ever. Um, and yeah, so hope it's probably a good time to, to get involved with it. I'm guessing there's a stud book for the UK captive wildcat population, is there? That's right, yeah. That's led by David Barkley. He's the stub at Keith of Wildcats. So all of the breeding recommendations come through him. So we will we, we take um, direction from David on what cats we breed. And my next question is about the, the population of wild cats, Sally, both in the wild and in captivity in the UK. How are they doing? Is it stable, increasing, decreasing? So in the wild, it's it's not good. You know, it's it's not looking good at all for the, the, those animals. and. It's really hard to determine a number. People always want to know a number or how many, how many are left in the world. And the truth is no one really knows because they're so elusive and the population is so small and fragmented. It's difficult to know how many exactly are left, but you'll read articles. Some will say there's 30 left. Some will say there's 400 left, but no one knows the exact number. But what we, what we do know is a population that does remain. It's not in a good way and it's not, it's not going to survive. We know that. Um, so that's that's decreasing. I think that's fair to say. Um, however, in captivity, the population is the best it ever has been. So David has been coordinating individuals and, and pairs to, um, to, to come together and breed. And I think we're at about 150 now for wild cats in captivity in the UK. And that will obviously, again, from direction from David, as and when he says, but that population will probably continue to grow as time goes on and, and the Scottish project and um, this new project that we're looking at will develop. So in terms of a captive population, it's, it's really, really healthy. Oh, that's fantastic news. That's great. Sally, what are the commonest mistakes in wildcat husbandry? Difficult to say, because not everyone wants to share their mistakes. Um, I'll go from my own experience as a thing, it's just that's, I think that's probably a fairer thing to do, but so definitely getting your enclosure design correct is absolutely paramount. Um, so we've learned that it's best to have, for instance, separation areas of your enclosure if you need to introduce new individuals. Um, our breeding facilities have a particular breeding um, option attached to them, which is a quieter um, sort of sort of a shed like structure so there's there's an off a completely offshore area if the female chooses to go in there um, so definitely having the right enclosure design um, den box design is also really paramount um, especially if you have breeding cats i think that's a very um, important husbandry element to have within enclosures and the number of den boxes as well so in the wild for instance wild cats will 
will move their kittens across different den sites. So it's important that you're trying to replicate certain things in captivity. So having a good amount of den boxes, for instance, for them to feel comfortable. Um, that's definitely very important is, is the design of the enclosure. Um, even down to, to diet as well. And just, but just knowing your individual as well. So you, you, we, we have a cat that just doesn't like mice. It just doesn't eat them. I've tried all sorts of things to get him to eat them. He doesn't eat them. So it's, it's knowing then the nutritional content of the food items that you're feeding out and what that cat's possibly lacking if it's not eating that food item and how you can make up for it with different other, with other food. So really knowing your individual and just because wild cats need this, that and that, it doesn't necessarily apply to all. And just like us, they have their own personalities and their dislikes and their likes. So knowing your individual and catering for that individual as well. That's really interesting. Um, Sally, do you take on volunteers in your project? Um, absolutely, we will be, yes. So we're quite in the infancy at the moment, but we, we will be taking on volunteers, absolutely will be without a doubt. Um, we take on regular volunteers at Wildwood anyway, and um, we, I think we pretty much have a volunteer nearly every day, every day of the week now, actually. So, um, yeah, and then they're, they're brilliant. We couldn't, we rely, we, they're just fantastic having our volunteers and, and helping us out. And, you know, I, I can learn from volunteers as well. Sometimes they'll, they'll say something, they actually hadn't, hadn't thought of that, and that's brilliant. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we are, we take volunteers um, regularly here at Wildwood. And we will we will need them for the wildcat project as well. Is there anything that you'd like to add, Sally? Um, all to say is is to watch the space for the uh, the wildcat projects that are going on because they are it's all in motion and you're just just keep an eye on it because more will be unfolding as it goes on and uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's a really exciting time and hopefully um, with the Scottish project and our new project going on here at Wildwood with Vincent and Gerald. And um, we'll be at a, a stage where we'll be able to save the species and, and bolster their numbers back in the wild. So, yeah, watch this space. Sally Holt, Wildcat Lead at the Wildwood Trust. Thank you very much for being on the Practical Animal Channel. Thank you, John. Nice to meet you. If you liked this video and you found it useful in explaining the skills and personal qualities that you need to get a job or establish a career working with Scottish Wildcats, then please click like. If you want to work with animals and have more access to exclusive video content on the skills and personal qualities needed to work with animals, then please subscribe to the channel and share it with your friends and followers. It seems there is no getting away from the fact that you need to do some voluntary work to work with wild cats. And a degree may or may not be necessary, depending upon whether you wish to be a zookeeper, responsible for wild cats as part of an animal collection, or whether you want to go into academia and study wildcats as a scientist. Next week, I interview Lainey Miller of the Great Ape Consultancy. You won't want to miss that one. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.